I forget who wrote the book about car. It's this wonderful coffee table book about car, and like page 220 or something, he talks about this watch. And he says, you know, I worked with this group of collectors, and basically what he says is that we drove him nuts. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of What You're Wearing. Today we have the extreme pleasure of having one of my watch heroes, Gary G, resident collector of online watch publication Quill and Pad, and also I think one of the best watch photographers in the business. Oh, thank you very Gary, much. Gary, welcome. Wow. It's my pleasure. Thank Thanks. you. Great to be here. Can you talk to me about what got you into collecting in the first place and maybe chronologically which one of these was the one that started the whole obsession? Okay, well, I would think I've been testing this theory out you know, all week here in Geneva with people that if you ask a man about how he got into watches, uh, the answer is almost always either my father had a watch or my grandfather had yeah. a watch. And in my case, my grandfather had a watch, and, and this is the watch right here. It's a pocket watch. It's not a valuable watch at all, uh, but it's uh, got an enamel dial. He worked for the railroad. Uh, he died when I was fairly young, but I certainly remember him very fondly, mm -hmm. and I always was fascinated by this watch and the way it ticked away and uh, he had it on a long chain, you know, so I think that really started it all. The pocket watch. Yeah, yeah the pocket watch. And after this, what was your first wristwatch? Well, uh, you know, happily I still have, but my first, I, I said I don't have my first ever wristwatch. Oh dear. No, my dad bought me a Timex Marlin. Yeah. Uh, and what well, I do have, I didn't bring it, but I have the recreation that they reissued like four years ago. Yeah. Uh, my wife bought it for me as a gift, but, and the, and the recreation is very, very true to the original, but I had that watch with the kind of 60s style yeah. elongated numerals and, I just wore the hell out of that watch, and uh, and again, you know, it's like I had my own wristwatch, and it was like the most exciting thing, the coolest thing, the coolest thing in the world to have yeah. your own watch. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, uh, my, my dad wore Timexes, and so I have some of his watches in the safe at home. Yeah. And if the robbers come, they can they, they can have those. Yes. Uh, although you know the sentimental value yes. is pr pretty <laughs> high. I think those are actually probably maybe even, even more priceless mm -hmm. than some of the pieces that we actually do end up getting. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But uh, obviously this one it would be your, your, your first? The first watch I ever bought for myself. The first watch you ever bought for yourself? Yeah, so in uh, 1971, uh, I was in this uh, band, uh, concert band that toured Europe, student <laughs> band of America. And um, uh, there are two requirements. One, you had to be able to play pretty well, and the other was you had to raise a thousand bucks. And so I worked jobs and you know raised a thousand bucks went on this month-long tour of Europe playing various cities, you know, these uh, high school band concerts. Yeah. And I had $48 in spending money for the month. And uh, the, in uh, Lucerne, they took us to Bucher, yeah. and a store right there on the end of the lake. And we went in and I spent $43 on that watch. And, uh, and then I had nothing to spend on, you know, <laughs> like no Cokes, no, no, no chips, no it's snacks. okay, but you have a watch. But I had a watch. You had a watch. And, um, there was another kid in the, in the group and his dad had money, I guess, and he bought a Rolex. Ooh. And all I heard about all, the whole trip was that you know he had 220 bucks and his dad told him he had to buy a Rolex because that was the only watch worth having. Yeah. And I didn't get a Rolex, I got this. But it's really cool, it's a, it's a chronometer certified. Mm -hmm. it's, I think it predicts my life in watches a little bit because it's, it's not a mainstream watch, right? It's mm -hmm. got a blue dial, fresh blue dial. It's kind of a ton of shape. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, it's 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 not the wa the first watch that a lot of people would pick. Mm. But I saw it. I thought it was great looking. I still think it's great looking. You know, after 53 years, it still runs great. Great size. Yeah, it's a, and, and it's a good size. You know, for the time, it was it was a, uh, and I again, it, it's still I mean, you see the edges are a little ragged. But I wore that watch every day for years, and uh, and it still works. It's held up, held up very well. Yeah. And then, you know, there's sort of a fallow period, you know, I uh, went to graduate school, got a job, worked, you know, had no money, yeah. uh, you know, adding up to the last nickel every month. Uh, I did uh, buy a Cartier tank watch. When I bought that watch, I, they had a, a big sale at the jeweler, it was 10% off. And I went down, I bought it, and then I was immediately terrified because I spent like 1900 bucks for the watch uh, in 1980. Yeah. And 
I wasn't making very much money. And I went home and I said, geez, I, I made a terrible mistake. <laughs> and I calculated it and I determined that if I wore the watch every day for the rest of my life, it would cost me 10 cents a day. Yeah. And I thought, well, I could afford 10 cents a day. Yeah. yeah. If I never buy another watch, you see that and didn't, it didn't work out so well. <laughs> yeah. If I only wear this watch every day yeah. for the rest of my life, yeah. 10 cents a day. Yeah, so then it's the early 90s and I discover a JLC. Uh, mm. And I think, you know, they're kind of two entry drugs for people who become more serious collectors, at least yeah. two, Rolex is one and yeah. JLC is one. Yeah. And I happen to go the latter route. You know, they're the watchmaker's watchmaker. They make mm. all these movements for everybody else. They have these cool complications. But this watch, the Geographique, fascinated me. I mean, it's, it, at the time, it was watch of the year in, I think, 1993. Mm. And um, the the mechanism to change the, the city and the second time zone is there. And it's like a clutch mechanism that basically isolates yeah. the movement from the movement of the watch, right? So, yeah. so it basically decouples the, the GMT movement and you just click the that second crown and it spins it around. And, and then that. you just keep doing that in meetings and knowing you've got nothing to do. Yeah, it's like, well, I wonder what time it is in Jakarta click, right click, now. Click, 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 click. You know, if you look at the first, or the second generation Vacheron overseas world time, it uses this movement. Yeah. You know, the Royal Oak world timer, yeah. or, you know, two time zone watch uses this because it's it's very characteristic, right? It's got the date here, mm. it's got the second time zone here, and it's got the sector power reserve mm. up there at 10. Yeah. And so it's really recognizable. Yeah, I, I know I know about that because actually my first watch was actually the Master Control Geographic. Really? Yeah, oh, cool. with the secular dial. So yeah, I know exactly what you mean by like, you know, having this and then like twisting in and having, just playing with the function, but yeah. Yeah, but, well, it, you know, good, good taste, what can I say? <laughs> All right, so now it's early 2000s and I started learning more about complications, complicated wristwatches, and this watch, the Audemars, Jules Audemars Equation of Time, mm. is a watch that I thought was just Insane. Insane. I couldn't believe the watch. You know, it's perpetual calendar, moon phase, equation of time, time of sunrise and sunset at, at your location. And it's based on the 2120 movement, mm -hmm. probably maybe the greatest automatic mm -hmm. movement mm -hmm. of all time. Ever, of yeah. All time. Yeah. And it's just crazy. And it does it all with, you know, springs and levers and gears and yeah. stuff, right? It's not like an electronic circuit. There's no battery. <laughs> There's no battery, but it does it all, right? Yeah. I stole that watch. Uh, well, astronomical complications, I mean, they don't, they don't really hold value. Yeah. You know, and I, uh, but I was looking for the watch, looking for the watch, and I was down at our local dealer one day, and I said, man, the watch I would love to own is the AP equation. equation of time. And he said, you'll never believe this, but someone has just traded in an equation of time, and they sold it to me for like nothing. And it needed a service, and they gave me the money for the service. They're just trying to, you know, get it out of inventory. So, you know, I've had it what twenty years now, almost, wow. and uh, made twenty years this year. And it's still one of the great, great watches, white gold with the gray dial. And that the, the out of our case, you know, with the brushed case band and the sh that shape, I think is a is a classic, classic. Wow. And its condition uh, is great. Well, you know, I don't wear, I, I wear them all, but I have no, enough I that I don't wear any single watch a lot. And I try to be really, really careful. The amortization is not, not yeah, working Yeah, it's, it's not working for me. It's not working. Not out. working for me. But though, if you buy a watch for me, it's going to be in good condition. It's be in That's condition. what I promise to you. Very good. Okay, so then same dealer. Very early on, he had relationships with a lot of the independent watchmakers. And, and to this day, Tim Jackson's his name. He's a big advocate for the independents. And he would bring to you know Northern California, he'd, he'd fly them over. So Peter Speak and Marco Lang yeah. and Yanni Halter and Carl Goodleinen, the McGonagall brothers, you know, and, and, and. Yeah. And basically have them in and, you know, for, the, for a weekend and have dinners and you'd meet them and, you know, you, you know for yourself. Meet the maker, want the watch, yeah, right? Yeah, and you know, yeah, yeah. and you meet somebody, you know, like a Vianney Halter, and he shows you something wacky like the Antiqua, right? And and you say, why? Why in the world would you do that? Yeah, why? Well, basically, it's like a bar bet, right? Yeah. That, you know, I bet you know Jeff Barnes. You know, you draw it, and I can make it, right? And so so Jeff Barnes, the designer, came back with this kind of Captain Nemo looking mm -hmm. steampunk yeah. design. But if you flip it over. It's just a regular round watch. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's based on a relatively standard conventional, movement, yeah. conventional movement. I mean, he's got the mystery rotor, yeah, yeah. Uh, the sapphire rotor, which is a cool feature. 
but besides from that, it just looks like a conventional. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah it's a conventional movement. Yeah, I mean, it's a conventional round watch, except on the dial side. Yeah, you're like, He's arranged Whoa. the displays, so you've got, you know, the day, the hour, and the, the minutes, the date, yeah. and leap uh, the leap year and the month. Uh, in separate windows, and it's got, I forget, 122 rivets, individual rivets yeah. in the case. I think his casework is really underestimated. Yes. The case is really beautifully made. Yeah. Cases in general nowadays, I feel like cases are kind of underrated as an aspect of a watch. It's like, it's actually what you touch most of the time. You're not really looking at a watch all the time. It's actually what you, you feel, and the, the casework is, I mean, I, I, at least for me, I think it's an underrated part. Yeah, I think you're right. I, and there's a renaissance, you know, with Shepard Sheppey working with Mr. Hogman yeah. and uh, a lot of the kind of interesting shaped cases. We'll maybe come to a couple in a little bit, but yeah, I'm a big fan of interesting, interesting cases. And maybe that brings us to, to this piece, which uh, by Kari Voodalainen, and it's got his characteristic teardrop lugs. Yeah. It's a watch that several of us commissioned together in 2009, I think. Mm. Uh, and he was going to make 10, and we commissioned six of them, uh, our group of six collectors in Northern California, and each one is unique. And so this one is one of two in rose gold. It's the only one with the darker two tone gray dial, chronograph moon phase, uh, big date. Wow. And then uh, Eddie Jacquet, the, the famous and reclusive. Uh, engraver had done a watch earlier for Kari, and I said, boy, I'd love to have a case back by Eddie, and Kari was able to broker it. So it's Kronos, the god of time, uh, and uh, the creation of the universe. Right? So you so, chose this specifically, or was that suggested to you? No, I looked around, looked around, and I, and I thought, well, maybe something around, you know, maybe Kronos. I don't know how yeah. Kronos <laughs> came to me. But then I looked for a bunch of different drawings, sculptures, paintings, mm -hmm of Kronos, and there's a particular sculpture that this is based on. Hmm. So I sent Eddie a photograph of the sculpture, and then he sent one rendering, and I didn't like the way the one wing was folded, and yeah. so I said, well, could you kind of play with Spit it? Out. And he did, and the second second drawing, I thought, that's absolutely it, and then he just did it. I mean, the, his work is fine. You know, he did the uh, the Jules Verne yeah. watches for uh, Max Muser. Yeah, phenomenal work. Yeah, I mean, it's, so it's absolutely a unique piece. It's the only one in the series with an officer case back. Yeah. Kind of the ultimate buddy watch. Yeah. It, the I forget who wrote the book about car. It's this wonderful coffee table book about car and like page 220 or something. He talks about this watch. And he says, you know, I work with this group of collectors. And basically what he says is that we drove him nuts. There's a really annoying guy. He told me to engrave the case. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, 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 and uh, you know, one guy wanted triangles, and one guy wanted <laughs> dots, and one guy wanted applied triangles, and they all wanted different colors. What a bunch of idiots. What a bu basically. <laughs> so we had, we, we had dinner with him after that, and I said, Kari, I'm sorry, I know we drove you nuts with those watches. And he's so gracious. He said, oh, no, no, it was no problem at all. And I said, I read your book. I read your book. I and he just book. turned completely red. And <laughs> we all could laugh about that. But, but that's, you know, I mean, to have a group of friends, uh, we all bought observatoires from Kari. Yeah. And when they were delivered, we all got together and shared that. And then, you know, this week in Geneva, what, 16 years later, five of the six of us are here as a group. And one has, has not been feeling well, so mm -hmm. he wasn't able to make the trip. But uh, he would have would have come. Yeah. And you know, those sorts of enduring friendships are are they're worth more than, than any watch. Exactly. You know. Exactly. Yeah.